Welcome to MX Matters. This is where we talk about the trends in the overall visual economy. Things that might be affecting the way that images and videos might be managed, delivered, displayed, and many times also the technology that's behind a lot of that. My name is Sam Brace. I am the Senior Director of Customer Education and Community at Cloudinary. And joining me for this episode, and luckily for many episodes of MX Matters, is Maribel, who is our Technology Partner Manager here at Cloudinary. Maribel, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Me and Maribel are going to be talking about something that is tied to a lot of the concepts we started to introduce in this overall MX Matters program, which is headless and decoupled architecture. And we've talked about it from the sense of maybe mock, maybe we've talked about it in terms of composable architecture. But essentially, as we've said in a few of these episodes, it's where people are taking a lot of the services that are going to be on the front end of a website or an application and also the back end and decoupling them. And they're able to still be able to use a lot of great services together thanks to the integrations and APIs that are able to be there. But it adds a lot of flexibility for developers when they're creating these various types of technology. And it also is introducing lots of concepts into this overall new composable front-end, back-end, decoupled technology stack. What's ended up happening in this case, though, is now we're starting to see various companies, various services starting to call themselves front-end as a service, not just software as a service, or back-end as a service. And these are somewhat new terms. And what we want to do is for those that are overall working in marketing, creative, e-commerce, whether you're planning a technology stack for vision or just trying to understand the technology trends, better understand what this means when we start to see companies coming out there and saying front end as a service, which is fairly a new term, and then similarly back end as a service. To bring in two experts in this overall field, we have Pierre and Rachel, who work for a company called Front Commerce. And they do some amazing work for companies when they're trying to make their front end flexible, modular, and part of their overall composable technology stack, particularly those in the e-commerce space. So as their name says, we're in commerce. Let's bring them on in and get a little bit more understanding of what this means for all of those various audiences I mentioned. So Pierre, Rachel, welcome to the program. Thank you for having us. Let's just break down the term in general. What exactly is front-end as a service? Um, so a front-end as a service is where the back-end and the front-end of a traditional e-commerce platform have been decoupled, so they're separated. And once that happens, we can add in a front-end on that's agnostic of the back-end. So it's completely independent in terms of how it functions, although they are loosely connected together. It's also that the front and and the back-end have very different life cycles. And w when you experiment based on your user behaviors, you might be deploying and changing your front end faster than your back end. And sometimes you will need to platform and change s services based on your business and your IT constraint. And then that will be the back end. So decoupling also ensure that both have their own life cycle and also they use the best technologies for each. So why is this happening? It's, as I mentioned, is this because of mock architecture and composable architecture? How is this overall front end, back end service? How did this trend or how did this situation start to come about? Is it because of that or is there other circumstances? I think it's growing because of that. It's like a lot of different movements within this technology space. The increasing importance of user experience and the complexity of consumer demands have really led to a growing demand for this kind of specialized service. It's important today for a brand or a retailer to be able to respond as quickly as they can to each of these factors. And if the front end is independent, it's just a lot easier and a lot quicker to bring anything that he needs to or she needs to <laughs> bring to the market as quickly as possible. And then coming back to composable commerce, a composable project doesn't need a front end. There are different solutions available. There's the headless monolith front end. A good example is the PWA Studio that Adobe have developed for their Magento stores and their Adobe stores. And then there's the do-it-yourself custom way. That's a different route. It can be very expensive, but it's completely custom, which can suit certain retailers' needs. And then we come back to front-end as a service, which there are certain different ones available, front commerce being one of them, where the technology is outsourced, which takes a lot of pressure off for an e-commerce, but they do still stay in control in terms of brand image, the features and what they want. And 
this kind of service really does allow for greater flexibility, which is super important today with the speed of the market, which is just at an incredible rate. It's really the need to accelerate, be more agile, and also due to the expectations of the users and the, the way they browse online and in commerce, the rise of mobile, maybe tomorrow, other solutions, it really ends up being the motor and the reason why people might go composable. And then in the end, it's also the technology because you might not take risks with your backend solution that's the core of your business and decoupling that to have a different front end will also help delivering faster and more often. Is there a good indicator to know when to switch to a front end as a service? Like I'm imagining most people may not have that now. Is there something that you do specifically that a business should be like, you know, now's a good time to change over and add this to our platform? When you might, might want to replatform your old stack, it can take a while. And sometimes that could be also a first step towards this replatforming. First, you remove the head of your backend and integrate a front-end as a service solution with your existing backend. So all your business rules, your, your interactions with other services also remain. And then you can start also removing responsibilities from this legacy backend. And ultimately, later, you can replatform your own solution. So a lot of people are starting to front end as a service for this reason. And it's a first step that allows you to have a faster time to market and your users and in e-commerce conversion rates all around that are starting to improve very quickly. Another way is when, when you want to address new markets, there are lots of B2B platforms and merchants that want to go and to have a shop for their B2B customers. Then you realize that all the information is spread across a lot of different systems. And when you develop that, it's easier to start with a decoupled front end than it is to integrate all those data into a unified data source. So the front end has its role. I'm also thinking about when you have a lot of different brands or regional constraints. Also, where in China, you may have some different constraints or the American region is more advanced with different uh, rules, then if you move everything also to a front end as a service, you can handle those subtle differences in an easier way than what you may have to do if you have a monolith and everything in your existing backend. So one thing that I was wondering about when it comes to the front end as a service situation, because we're using a lot of terms that are tied to legacy and monolith and I'd love to just unpackage that a little bit. What exactly does that mean if I were talking about legacy backend or monolith backend and saying that you could put a front end in front of that or you have a composable back? Can you explain some of those terminologies for maybe those that aren't completely familiar with this topic? Yeah, so um, a monolith is a software that does all the things. For instance, in commerce, it will handle your content management, create pages, also user authentication, managing cards, checkouts, product information also. So everything is there. The search logic, everything is in the same system. It has so many responsibilities. It does many things. And over time, any company has customized it and adapted it to their own business. So at some point, it could be difficult to update it and to upgrade it. And sometimes it can remain on old technologies have security problems and become slower and slower. But it's such an important part of your infrastructure and your total company, then in the end, you, you don't want to touch it anymore. And that's what we call legacy systems. And that's where you start decoupling that and introducing a front end and removing the responsibility of displaying things to the user is a first step towards removing all those responsibilities that were added over time to this system. And then, for instance, you can say, I will use a search service also that does just the search part or an authentication service that will handle user management. And in the end, you remove responsibilities from this old service and you are less dependent on it and you can change it if needed. 
because sometimes editors stop also supporting this platform. So yeah, it's really like having just one single very critical and important piece. It's also important to understand that how important it is to have a maintainable solution that evolves over time. And by going down this route, it's much easier to embrace new technology. It's much easier to look at innovating in terms of your web and user experience and keep the pace with all the different changes that are happening in technical terms and in the technology world by going down this route. And it's really the, one of the best first steps to creating a fully up-to-date modern commerce experience. And also to adapt to new trends, like what we've seen okay. with ChatGPT and AI over the past few months is kind of crazy. And at some point, merchants or content writers, a lot of markets are going to evolve with that. And if you have already all the species ready, and then there is an important term, which is API, meaning that they have a way to expose the data and for you to reuse in other systems, then it will be also much more easier to take this new path of AI if you want new usages for that, or just to take an AI solution and add it into your front end at some very specific parts to improve the user experience. And the people that are ready for that might have competitive advantages over their competitors. Can you elaborate on that? You mentioned if you're wanting to get into the AI projects, but is there like a certain type of website that would benefit from using Frontend as a service? There are many different projects that could benefit from it. Mostly when you have a lot of different backends that you may want to use, because for instance, you have very specific use cases and very specific needs. Search is a good example of that. Re-implementing search and providing very accurate results to the user and personalized results is a very hard task. But there are services that does that in a way better way than any solution. In that case, you might have an interest of moving to a front-end as a service to replace search with this service. For content management also, you may have different teams in your company and the marketing team that might prefer creating content in a very specific software that handles all of that for content creators that will be able to update images and really improve that part of your website. And sometimes those are not the same people. And also your expectations might be very different from services. Like if you, if you want really perfect images that works on all sizes of screen for a website, it's very, very difficult to do that well. So there are services that does that. And that means that any kind of websites really can benefit from it. We're in the e-commerce area, but content, also news. So if I'm sitting here and I'm saying, okay, I oversee digital marketing and I want to have the best, fastest website, I want to make sure that when people go to it, it's loading the content as quickly as possible, having an amazing user experience. What specific elements of front end as a service really push that in that sense? Is it where I could do a lot of these things well with a legacy system, but it gets even better? What exactly is it that is able to push the performance elements of my website moving to a front end as a service solution? I didn't even know about that this kind of thing existed before I came and worked for Front Commerce a couple of years ago. And there is just so many different things that really push for it for me as a marketer, but not necessarily as anyone that's really very technical minded. The fact that you can connect to nearly any CMS is absolutely incredible. You really can choose what you want and how you want it. The fact that when you want to make any updates to what is being displayed, any kind of visual update. You don't have to wait for the back end to be ready and to roll out a whole bunch of different things and updates and releases for it to be available. It's pretty much real-time display in terms of what we can do with the user experience and, and it's absolutely incredible. The way that we can create experiences that are completely translatable across different kinds of devices is just super duper as a marketer. Adding in new channels when and as you need them is very quick and easy. It's just amazing how quickly you can go and how you can update your experience in terms of what you want to show and what you want to say to your customers, the level of personalization that can go in place as well. It's more than just a bonus. It's just where things are going and what we want. And it's just so satisfying and it empowers marketing teams and digital teams 
And it takes a lot of the stress out of communicating with backend teams and with all the different operational teams as well, which just makes for a much easier work experience as far as I can tell. When you browse on the web and on the website, all the technologies are similar. In the end, it's your browser that will ask an HTML page and that gets the information. And to do that, they do requests through the internet. So no matter if you have a monolith or what programming language you've used in the end, you serve HTML files to users. However, browsers and mobiles uh, and even the web standards that allows these communications have evolved a lot over the past 10 years or even more. The way user browse online has also changed a lot because when you are on your mobile, you're commuting and you have a poor internet connection, it's really not the same way you browse the internet when you are with your laptop, with fiber, with a high speed internet and a 4K screen that displays a lot of information. To cope with all of these situations, so these different devices, the network speeds, and also the fact that you always want more and more personalized content, you want to get the information faster. All of that requires new technologies and you need to evolve and cope with this fast pace of expectations and leverage the new technologies that's available. And to do that, usually, those monolithic backends or legacy systems that we mentioned might be limited in that because this is not their core value. They manage promotions, pricing for e-commerce or search or things like that, but not all these new things. So the front end became a responsibility on its own. Yeah, that's really important because it can leverage all of this and focus only on those aspects. So for instance, If you want a page to be displayed faster, of course, it needs to be generated. So the HTML needs to be generated as fast as possible. But then also it depends if the server, so the computer that will give you this HTML is close to you or if it's at the opposite of the world. So there are systems that are named content delivery networks, CDNs, that allows you to have these pages as close as the user as possible. So if you come from the US, you will have a server in your city that will provide you this information. And if I'm in Europe, I will get one in Paris, for instance. So this is also a good way to do that. But technologies has evolved also around that. I won't enter into too many technical details because I could speak for hours. But I can now From these servers that are very close to the end user, you are now able also to include some personalization and change the content that you will serve to the user, depending on where he is based. And you can do a lot of things like that. So those are examples of what you can do to really deliver fast experience. Uh, And also for images, if you have a poor internet connections, you may not want to deliver a nice, very high definition image because that would be a lot of data to transfer and the user usually doesn't want that. So there are a lot of personalization and that's important to really take each of these use case and handle this. And that's the responsibility of the front end. And so as far as like tool sets that come with the front end as a service, so you had mentioned personalization and CDNs. Can somebody expect when they go into a front end as a service solution and that personalization capabilities are included or maybe analytic or APIs to work with CMSs? For the technical parts, usually you will have the front end. So either you use a front end as a service solution, or you can also create it. Like there are a lot of services that are just creating what we name boilerplate. So basically you take the code and then it's your responsibility to maintain it over time. While a front-end as a service solution, like front commerce, has regular releases with new versions and you will update your software and benefit from the latest, everything that I explained before. So the latest technologies, standards and performance improvements. Then usually you have an API orchestration layer or in front commerce, we use GraphQL as the technology. So a GraphQL gateway that basically allows you to have a unified access to all your data, no matter where they are located. And then you must have an e-commerce platform we've already mentioned, and you will choose the search service that will match your needs. So with personalization, 
You can also have search services that are very good for internationalized content and global content. Then you have also hosting providers with CDNs. So there are all kinds of different systems available. Some of the bigger names that we hear about all the time are Contentful, Prismic, even WordPress, and they all have different features and functionalities. But what is general with each of them is that it's possible to create dynamic, rich content that, as I said before, is displayable across all different devices in real time. And being able to do this really brings a different level of communication with one's user. And it's possible to create experiences that touch them on an emotional level, that are completely personalized. It's absolutely incredible today how much easier it is to have what you want when you want it, even in terms of an e-commerce platform and how we talk to our customers and how we communicate with people. And it's just, I don't know, I just think it's great. (laughs) So I think the thing that I keep hearing and I'm trying to put like various hats on as I'm hearing these conversations take place is that because this is new, front as a service is something that at least I hadn't heard about in the past, let's say, two years. It's it's relatively new as a concept for probably a lot of people that are diving in and we're introducing a lot of new different types of services that are coming in as a service concepts. What are the reasons that this is starting to take hold? Like, are we seeing market maturity coming in? Is there certain moments where people are saying, I want to go headless, but I'm missing this component? What's the thing that should be standing on somebody's mind saying, oh, I need front end as a service. What's that moment that you feel like a lot of people, maybe they work a front commerce, maybe you've had conversations with them in other places, but what's that like normally that aha moment that says, I need this thing. One of the first that we often heard is when people have started to go headless and to consume data from APIs of different services. Usually they try with a do-it-yourself approach. So they take a boilerplate, for instance, headless service, have these examples or starter kits, and they start to create their whole user experience and their front end for that. But then technology evolves. Developers might have left the companies and 10 new versions of the framework they were using have been released and they never managed to catch up because It's very easy to underestimate how much work this is to maintain that over time with the latest standards and technologies. We see a lot of people that come to a front-end as a service solution from this first bad experience. And the fact that we are here to guarantee a migration path and the fact that if you start your project today and that in five years, there is a totally different way to shop online. I've mentioned AI, or we don't know how people will browse and and buy online in the next few years. But with the front end as a service, we can guarantee that we will release new versions that will allow them to go that path without investing in rewriting everything every two years. We have to take into consideration today that even though um, we're looking at business benefits of this kind of service, the technical benefits are equal to a business benefit in the end, because that's just how everything works now. And backward compatibility, what you were talking about, is also really important because not everyone, not every service is able to offer that. Reinvesting every couple of years in terms of budget and in terms of time in redoing your entire storefront is a huge undertaking. And being able to avoid that is a blessing, really. So you mentioned being able to re-platform and that in itself can be a big investment. From your experience, How long does it typically take to decouple and what other challenges that organization or developers may encounter by doing the decoupling? I know it from commerce, the whole decoupling, going headless, putting on the new front end can take around 12 weeks, but I don't think it's any quicker than that. (laughs) Yeah, it really depends. Uh, Theoretically, you start your project and you have a front end that works, but then it really depends on the level of customization that you want. And then I want to make sure I understand. So let's say that I have a monolith backend, something where it's large. I've been in this system for years, and we know that sometimes things take a long time to replace that monolith backend. It seems like what you're saying, because I've separated front end from back end, I could essentially move very quickly with updating the front end, but still keep the, the legacy back end. I can do things iteratively, essentially. It, it, exactly. And when, when you've done that, you can rework your brand or the user experience 
at least in the commerce ecosystem, it's very important because you can have better results and more satisfied customers way faster because all those backend monolith things are mostly for your own stakeholders internally. But when you're selling online, it's always good there to have more satisfied customers and increase your revenue also. So yeah, this is the first step. And then you really have the freedom to decide when you will continue the project of changing your backend. And also maybe sometimes evaluate new solutions while you are working on your front end. You can also start reevaluating business rules, have workshops, prototype a few things. And I think this is a good way to go because we often underestimate the amount of customization that went into a system. And that's when you start digging into the features, into the specific things that you realize all those things that were added in the software over the past 10 years or 15 years. Well, to me, that seems like the right way to prioritize it. A lot of times when we're talking about headless architecture, it can seem like this is a big change. And what I like about what you're prescribing here is if I need to do this, it's kind of like, how do you eat an elephant? You do it one bite at a time. And so the way that you do this is like, okay, don't try to tackle the whole thing. Focus on the front end first, because that's the thing that's impacting your users, your buyers, the people that are experiencing the overall application or the website. And then, as you're saying, evaluate the back end. So I think it makes a ton of sense to do it iteratively, but it also seems in terms of prioritization, I would say I need to focus on the front end first and then focus on the back end because of that effort. Does that seem correct to you where focus on front end and then go back end rather than do it the other way around? To me, it really depends again. As sometimes you may have like huge constraints on your back end and may want to change that. Like you have a lot of contents and it needs to be updated. You want to change the way you communicate with your customers. So here the front end it may be okay to keep it and change the way you generate content and you do search engine optimizations or things like that. But yeah, usually at least in front commerce, we really want to target merchants that are user centric. Usually you first think about your users, your customers, the way they browse online and on your website and how you interact with that. And starting with the front end really go with that way of thinking and of managing priorities and projects. One thing I also wanted to ask you about is we've talked about content delivery networks in different places in this conversation. We talked about CDNs. And to me, it sounds like when you're thinking about content delivery networks, you're asking for it to display everything that's through the front end through a CDN as part of this front end of a service solution. Is that also applied to the images and videos that are coming through? Is that, that should also be coming from CDNs? Is that also where if, if there's maybe other elements to be thinking about there? But talking about when we're talking about page delivery, e-commerce, is that what elements need to be coming through the CDNs? What things should be people thinking about when they talk about front end service and then that part of that tech stack? Yeah, everything is a good candidate to go there. And it's even more important and easier to do if this content doesn't change very often, because if you have a product page and the stock is always changing or you change your price very often, sometimes it could be contrary to have that always in a CDN. But for images, of course, because this is like on a website, images and videos, those are the biggest things that you will have to download when you browse a website. So this is the most important things that needs to be optimized on your website. So of course, if it's closer to you, then you will download it faster. And also different solutions also have features towards delivering the best image or video possible to the user. Again, when you browse from a tablet or a phone in landscape mode or from a big laptop, from a TV, from your car, you will have a different screen size and screen density. So the file you will download must be different depending on the size of your window. And also, as I mentioned, if you are in the train with your uh, nice laptop with a high density screen, but you don't have a good code network quality, then it's also better for you to deliver an image that is smaller in terms of size so you can view it faster. So all of these services and delivery solutions for a media are really important if you have a website with a lot of illustrations, images, and videos. 
So let's say that I'm thinking about this now. I'm like, okay, great. There's something that you hear about front end as a service. I feel like I might need this for my company. How do you go about getting buy-in internally for something like this? Like, let's say that I'm the person that's going to be making decisions about this, or maybe I'm helping influence the decisions they're going to be taking place at a company. What are the things that we need to be able to tell within the organization that helps people understand the need? First, ensure that everyone in the company knows where the data comes, like what are the systems, and ensure also, of course, that they have APIs. But if the front end as a service solution supports it, most of the time that it does. And then you can start prototyping things. We do have several customers that try quickly to see what works out of the box and what will be customized. And then you can also analyze how long it takes in your current solution to deliver new features, to iterate on the user experience and to change something on pages to improve the user experience. Most of the time, it will already have been pain points internally, and this is a known issue. And trying to highlight that to the stakeholders and discussing like the flexibility that you're missing that might improve also your conversion rates can be also a good indicator of that. We see a lot of people that detected over the past few years that most of their traffic has totally switched from desktop users, users on the desktop to mobile. And their website was maybe good on desktop, but on mobile, it was terrible. And they started to see their dissatisfied users and decided that they needed to improve this use case of browsing their website on mobile. So it could also be a good way to say, okay, look at our website on a mobile or on a slow connection, and you will see all those issues. Yes, basically just an overall across the board, good knowledge of what business goals are and how the technology can improve those business goals, especially things like organic traffic, mobile browsing, as Pierre said, conversion rates. I mean, we have customers that have doubled their mobile conversion rate almost immediately after implementing front end as a service. You just really have to know what you want and go through all the different issues that you have within the business and work out how to resolve them. And quite often, a lot of different issues can be resolved just with this update. Like, well, it's not an update, it's more than an update, but, you know, just changing things around in the platform and bringing in new technology, respond to what the consumer is looking for, which then responds to the business objectives in the next few years. And are there any other trends that you're seeing for a front end as a service that you can let us know or give us some insight on? There are lots of trends all the time in this mm -hmm. space. It really evolves a lot, to be honest. Right now, we are also seeing a lot of work about personalization and really adapting a lot of things on a page and depending on many factors. So. In the front end, that means a lot of technologies to be able to change that. And it enables also a lot of new ways of displaying the content to the users. I really think also that in terms of user experience and the way you provide information to someone that comes on your website, we are going to see a lot of changes and that will need to adapt your front end also and the way you display the information, where you get it. I've mentioned AI as an example. For uh, years, people uh, have said that it's important to have nice UI that works on mobile. And then there is ChatGPT with only a chat box that comes here. You just ask things and it seems to return information that, that makes sense without you having to click around and change that. And we see a lot of softwares that starts to integrate this way of being able to understand what the users want to do. And you can put that just in a small part of your existing website on your front end and benefit from a lot of other things. Or say that, for instance, all the personalization of the products that are displayed or the content that's displayed can change based on many different criteria that you will mention. And that could also be determined by an AI, for instance. I really think that there will be a lot of interesting use cases towards the front end space. But yeah, it's moving very fast. And I think it's a great 
way to look at it because as we said, this is a trend that's emerging. And I think there's always going to be new trends that are going to continue to move technology forward, especially with this. And it's not like people are going to stop purchasing and doing things on the internet to be able to help with their own lives, being able to supplement it by being able to find the best products, best services. So it's where it's great that we're able to address the trends that are tied to this. And Pierre, Rachel, this is great to see the work that you're doing and helping our audience better understand front ends of service in general. So this is great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful talking. And Mirabel, it is wonderful always to have you for this program. It, the insights you have working with all of our various technology partners here at Cloudinary, it's fascinating. So thank you for being part of this conversation as well. Thank you. Absolutely. And of course, if you've enjoyed this conversation, make sure that you, on whatever service you happen to be listening to this on, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify, all the different places we happen to be on, make sure you're giving it a like and subscribe so that way you know what is coming when it comes to the trends that are affecting the visual economy for future episodes of MX Matters. On behalf of everybody at Cloudinary and the MX Matters team, thank you and hope to find you at a future episode.